Almighty God and Father, we thank you for this chance to meet together to study your word. The Bible, which has been brought to us through pain, suffering, through sacrifice, down through all these generations, and with your hand upon it to see to it that it comes to us, as a revelation of what you have done with man and of those men who have known you and known you best. We ask you, Father, to help us to understand, give us open and receptive minds today as we try to study your word, try to know you and understand you better. We ask this of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, what we just did was an act of worship. I don't think that comes as a giant surprise to a lot of you people, but if we were to talk about it in, the, in terms of the, the biblical word or the Old Testament word, worship, which you find from time to time, you might be surprised as to what part of what we did was actually worship. That part was the bowing of the head, oddly enough. Uh, most of us worship every day. You know, we bow our heads when we say grace at, 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 at dinner. Uh, we bow over our stool or over a chair in order to pray. The Hebrew word normally translated worship means to bow down and to do obeisance. Now, if you'll turn back to Genesis, the 24th chapter, Genesis 24, and we are basically reading up to the uh, this woman who was talking to the, to the prophet. She said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bare to Nahor. She said, Moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender and room enough to lodge in. Now, what, what this is, this is Abraham's servant who has been sent over and asked God to take him on his way and, and, and to bring him to fulfill Abraham's will. He's prayed about it, he asked for God's guidance, and God has brought him to it. And he had put a sign up as to what the woman was going to say if, if this was what was going to happen. So she said, we have straw and provender enough and room to take it in. And it says, the man bowed down his head and worshipped Jehovah. Now, this is uh, an in, kind of an interesting little phrase here. It basically says he bowed down twice. It says he bowed down and bowed down to Jehovah. And there are two completely different Hebrew words. It's odd. For the, the bowing down that, we, that, that is done is something with which we are totally familiar. But in the East, there was a, it was a more of a custom to bow, not just bow, but to bow completely down all the way to putting your, your forehead on the ground, as you see Arabs do when they're praying to Mecca. But it is a form of obeisance, and it is something that you, that you do when you come into the presence of a king. You will bow down and, and, and do obeisance. It is a symbol of, uh, uh, of submission, a symbol of humility, a, sub, a symbol of the recognition of the greater of the two people. Now, as you wait, make your way through the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that is translated worship most of the time in your Bible is the word that simply means, I mean, in fact, all the time, I believe, is a word that simply means to bow yourself down in obeisance to a person of higher authority. It is an, an instantaneous act. It is not a long, drawn-out process. It is something you do to say, I submit, and then you rise back up again. As we do in prayer, we submit to God, and then we rise back up, and then we begin to speak so that, that we continue on in that way. Now, to, just to illustrate what I'm talking about, if you'll turn back a page in Genesis 23, and Abraham, in this case, is... Uh, uh, negotiating the grave for Sarah. This is one of the great passages in the Bible. I always love this particular passage. It says Sarah was 120, I'm sorry, 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the, of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abram stood up uh, from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you, Give me possession of a burying place with you that I might bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth, by the way, the, Heth, the children of Heth are Hittites. The children of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord, you are a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury your dead. None of us shall withhold from you his sepulchre, but that you may bury the dead. What I really enjoy about this passage, I remember the years ago when I read it, I think the first time with, with, with really grasping what was happening here, is the grace of these men. You know, as the man stands up and speaks, you know, I'm, I'm a stranger, I'm a sojourner, I'm asking you to give me a place of possession. I want to purchase a place so that I may bury my dead. And they said, you are a mighty prince among us. You just take the choice of all the places that we have here to bury your dead, 
None of us shall withhold from you his sepulcher. You can have any place we have. The, the, the graciousness, the hospitality of it is really remarkable. By the way, it is this tradition of, of, of grace and hospitality the Arabs try to maintain to this day. You will oftentimes find far more hospitality among these people than you would among our people. Abraham then stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. The word bowed himself is the word that is elsewhere translated worship. Of the two words in the verse we looked at before, bow down and worship, this is the same word as worship. Now, if you take it in the traditional sense that you and I use the word worship, you see what you run into in this verse? It says he worshipped the people of the land, and it could. Some, I'm surprised some biblical scholar hasn't taken this to mean that well, what Abraham did was to worship the gods of the people of Heth, and uh, and that they this was some religious deal that he did. But it was not. What it was, he rose up and did obeisance. He did the sign, the outward sign of, of obeisance to these people. I mean, this was their land. It was their property. It was their sepulchers, their grave sites that he was asking about, and he graciously bowed down in a, sin, in a sign of obeisance to these people. And it continues to say that he communed with them, saying, If your mind be that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me for Ephron the son of Zobar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is in the, in the end of his field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a burying place among you. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered, answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went into the gate of the city, saying, No, my lord, hear me. The field I give to you, and the cave that is therein, I give it to you. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Notice this. I mean, it's, 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 he says, I will pay it. Whatever he wants, whatever his price is, I will pay it. This man gets up and says, No, I won't take anything for it. It's yours. I give it to you in the witness of all these people. Uh, bury your dead. It shows, really, I think, the respect that Abraham was held in by these people where he dwelt as a stranger in what, you know, certainly they considered their own land. Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land again. Same word. He did obeisance one more time. And he spoke to Ephron, the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if you will give it to me, I pray to hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my, my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying, My lord, hearken to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. And they went ahead and made the, the arrangement and went on through with it. It's an, it's an interesting, I think, case of, of the courtesy, of, of kindness, of generosity, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an old, old Eastern custom of negotiation and of talking with people. But of what's really of interest to, to me here is, is the fact that, that it, it, it brings us up against, I think, a, uh, a flaw in, in our thought patterns, in our world today, when we read the Bible, that we are not really quite thinking of things in the same way that the people who wrote these things were thinking about them. That the word worship, as we use it now today, does not mean precisely the same thing that it meant when those people used the word, right? To them it meant simply to bow down. To us, it means rather, I think, something more than that. Other examples of it are Joseph in Genesis 37.9. Joseph's dream, if you remember, uh, he dreamed, uh, he said, uh, he dreamed and had another dream and he told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. So the idea was then that, that these, the, the sun, moon, and stars were bowing down to Joseph as a part of his dream and the symbolism that was in the dream is all a part of the story you can read in Genesis 37, 9. Genesis 47 and verse 31. He said, swear unto me, and he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. You know, this is a negotiation thing, and he's getting a promise out of somebody. And he bows down himself on the bed's head, much like I think probably you would bow yourself over a stool if you were going to pray, uh, I, that I would gather. But the, the use of the word is what I'm pointing to here. And then Exodus 18, 7, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. Again, he did obeisance. What does it mean? It means he bowed down in obeisance. It is a form of obedience, of uh, submission, of acknowledgement of the greatness of the other person that's involved in it. One re rather interesting case of it is found in Numbers 22 on the case of, uh, of uh, Balaam and his ass. Numbers 22, 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down, the, old, the other word, and his, his head, and fell flat, worshipped 
upon his face. It was the, the translators at this point say he bowed down and fell flat on his face, but the fell flat word is the word that is translated worship elsewhere. In the New Testament, it's a little different. The word is proskuneo, and what it, what it comes from another derivative of another word, and what it, it, it means in Greek, in the, in, in the Eastern word, Greek world, was to kiss your hand in obeisance to another person. And the, the thematic, of, uh, it comes from the idea of, of uh, a combination of to lick toward and the idea that a dog would lick your hand, you know, and uh, the kissing of the hand toward another person was, a, it was, was in the East a, a type of obeisance. You may have seen this, uh, you know, from time to time as people will go, you know, when they come up and kiss their hand toward the other person. It's not a blowing of a kiss. In, in Eastern cultures, it is a, a, a symbol of obeisance and that one is obeying the other hand. Uh, the the uh, definition of it is to kiss the hand towards one in token of reverence. That's what the, the New Testament word means. And among Orientals, especially the Persians, to fall upon the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. And in the New Testament, by kneeling or prostration, to do homage to one or to make obe obeisance, whether in order to express respect or to make supplication. The use of homage shown to men and beings of superior rank. So both both Testaments, the idea is the same to do obeisance, uh, to show submission, to honor people of superior rank, and it has nothing to do, and is, I'm sorry, I won't say it has nothing to do, it does not have to have anything to do with the worship of God. It is more, unless it is obeisance done to God, for obeisance can be done to another man. Uh, so just, to, I went through all that just to give you a little bit of a perspective on uh, the meaning of the word and the fact that in the Bible it means something somewhat different from what it does today when we speak of worship services. Or actually, I think probably we use the word often in conversation more in the line of adoration than in in, this, in the biblical sense of obeisance to another person. We use uh, it, as I say, we, it comes much closer in our usage to adoration, but an adoration. I think is very close in, in a biblical sense to the word praise. You don't find the word adore or adoration in the King James Version of the Bible. I don't know if it crops up in other translations. If any of you are looking at one and you stumble, you can find, uh, well, I won't, uh, I won't send you anywhere right now, but uh, if you stumble across it, you might bring it up later because the word praise, as it is often used is in the Bible, is much closer to the sense of the word adoration as we use those words, to, the, the word adoration today, the times change. You know, 1611 English was very different from ours, and this is when the King James Version was translated. And a lot of the, the, the meaning of words become changed. Praise is, is really a case in point. Uh, I think the word has been, is, is devalued in our language from what it would have been in, in, in the King James Bible. Uh, well, for example, let's turn back to uh, uh, the 50th Psalm. Now, let me show you what I mean. Psalm 50. Now, if I can find my way there, for some reason. Did I say Psalm 50? I'm at 150. That's a small variation. No wonder I wasn't going where I meant to be. The 150th Psalm. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. What a... <laughs> you want to look for the word praise in the Bible? Look for the 150th Psalm and you'll have all you need. Uh, the... As I said, though, I think in our, our language today, praise has been somewhat devalued. I praise my dog, you know. I pat my doggy on the head and give my doggy, uh, you know, good doggy, good doggy. I praise my dog. And, and, and so it isn't just that, but I really do think that, that the word has lost a lot. There are those people who say, you know, I remember my grandfather, uh, when he got converted and became Assembly of God, it was... He just was saying praise the Lord about every other sentence, which is all rather distracting to the rest of the relatives who were used to a different a different man who had a rather rather uh, strong language when he was talking to his mules. And uh, then when you get into that, well, you know, we, we made it into town okay today, praise the Lord. And it was it was praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And and 
you have a, a television network called Praise the Lord, and, and uh, the word, you know, in, in what's called praise worship nowadays, uh, I really sometimes think, I sometimes wonder to what extent people are really staying with the meaning of the Bible and the way that the word was used in the Bible. And I really think that adoration comes very close to the idea of praise and of what praise is, is really supposed to be. Now, I want to try to explain this to you a little further today uh, to see if I can, can put a new idea in your mind or something perhaps a little different in your mind from what might, might have been there before. Outside on my deck, I didn't see it look to see, to see what, what progress it had made this morning, but there was a rosebud yesterday, rather largish uh, rosebud in, in one of the pots that we have out here. And about, I'd say about uh, five or six times through this season, that rose bush has given us one really nice rose. Now, sometimes it's been better than at other times. And the last, just when we got home from the feast, we cut off all the buds before we left, and we got home for the feast, we had this one gorgeous rose sitting on top of one stem out there, all by itself. It's just an absolutely gorgeous thing. Now, there aren't many things that I can think of in nature that are more beautiful than a, than a rose that's closely examined. I mean, the whole combination of this thing, of the, of the, of the, it, its appeal to the sense of smell, its scent, its the touch of the, the velvet touch of a rose, the, the, the color. We had at our, our house where we used to live in Tyler, quite a number of roses had a, 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 a golden rose that was just, just deliciously beautiful. And then I had a, my favorite was a, a, a cream rose with blush tips around it, which made a, made, a, made a rose about the size of my hand when it was fully out. That was one of the most, I think maybe the most beautiful plant I had ever seen in my life. Of course, beauty is always in the eye of the, of the beholder. But I, I think that, I think of these roses when I have paused to look at them, and they give me a moment of exquisite pleasure. But you think of the pleasure, real, genuine pleasure that you get in that moment from the scent, the smell, the touch, the experience, the beauty, the symmetry of this thing, and the design and all of it, is absolutely gorgeous. Now, C.S. Lewis made me think about this. He was talking about a friend of his uh, and he who were walking through a forest one day, and in their conversation, they were, they were, they were on, on a nature walk, and they were talking about God. They were talking about prayer. And they were talking about prayer as worship and, and adoration and so forth of God. And C.S. Lewis at the time was a relatively new Christian, I think, and he was working his way through this idea of a God who says, praise me, and uh, of the, the whole question of worship and adoration and, and, and trying to grow in the knowledge of prayer, and he was working on some ideas. And the fellow he was with says, here, why don't you start with this? And he just turned aside, and there was a brook there, and a little waterfall cascading into the brook, and there was green moss and soft green moss, and it was uh, in ferns that were growing around a real, in a natural setting went over to the little, little thing, cupped the water in his hands, splashed the cold water on his face and on his hands. It was a, a warm day. And said, so start with this. And he did that. And he, sa he said, it was at that moment that he began to think of, of, of this thing here that he had just experienced as a, a, this little momentary pleasure as something that had come from God. In fact, what was striking about the, the illustration as he began to make it, and I thought about what he said, he said that every pleasure is like a, a, a little gift of God. It is a little flicker of a reflection of the glory of God as it makes its way down into man. And we're not talking about sinful pleasures. Uh, Lewis had an interesting argument about that because he said that the pleasure is, in, in sin is still pleasure. And the pleasure itself is, is one thing. It's, it's the unlawfulness of it, the taking of it when it is not yours. The stealing of a beautiful thing doesn't mean the thing you stole is no longer beautiful, does it? And so that his, he, he, he's trying to step around the idea that of living in pleasure and lust and that kind of thing, which if you're living for that and living in that is destructive to a human being. But what he is saying is that if you can grasp it, if you can deal with it, that the experience of a, this, this, this little fleeting pleasure that comes your way every so often is really a manifestation of the glory of God. And I thought, isn't that interesting? And he made this one reference. Psalm 16 and verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In you is fullness of joy in your presence. 
and at your right hand are pleasures evermore. And, you know, we're, we're conditioned, I don't know what it is, to think in, of, of religion in terms of duty and responsibility and uh, sacrifice and self-denial and all the things that, 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 that many of them, I mean, all, of, all of which are correct and all of which are good and all of, you know, the, the self-denial is required, the, the, uh, the doing without sometimes is required, uh, sacrifice is required. All these things are there, and yet that seems to be the, the pale of one's thinking sometimes in, in this way. Now, Lewis noted also in this, in this, in this thing, which, which struck me in a way, I, somehow it had just never struck me before. He noted that there is a difference between gratitude and adoration. For example, it's only right that we should thank God for his goodness in giving us our daily bread. It's absolutely right. We sit down at the table, our family are around us, we bow our heads and say, thank you, God, for, for giving us the food that is before us today. He said, but when you pause to think about the apple that is there on the table, he didn't use an apple, but it'll serve for me. You hold an apple in your hand as one of these, uh, these beauties that has kind of a gold and red and it's large and it's shiny. And it's, 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 the, the appeal, the pleasure the, of, of, of looking at an apple is one thing. The smell of an apple is another pleasure. The, the snap as you bite into it and, and the crunch as you take a bite out of the apple is another pleasure. All these things are pleasurable to us. The taste of an apple is pleasure. The juiciness of it is pleasure. The, the texture of the color I mean, and, and of, 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 the, of, the, of the meat of the apple is, is there. And so we can sit there and eat an apple and experience this thing, having thanked God for it, of course. But it's when you begin to think, what kind of a person would not merely feed me, but would feed me with this? What kind of a God, what kind of a being is this who grants such pleasure in these things? And it is a tremendous pleasure to eat and to drink. We get great joy out of this thing. We also get a lot of guilt out of it from time to time. But the truth is that the pleasure of, of food it is something that God has given us to enjoy. He didn't make apples gray and peaches gray and all this type of stuff colorless. He didn't make them to where they were not no particular taste. They didn't make us like we were dogs, where we could eat the same old dog food day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, because the whole objective is simply to get your belly full so you have the energy to go on. He didn't make us like that. He granted us pleasure. We're, I, I, I think other creatures experience pleasure, but they do not experience it like we do, and they're not conscious of pleasure as, as human beings are. And, and the point he made is, and I think he's dead right, is that it is, it is in that moment when you begin to contemplate the nature of the God who gave you this gift. This is where adoration begins. This is where not mere gratitude is saying, thank you, boy, for what you did for me. I really appreciate it. But the realization of who it was that gave it, what kind of a being he was that gave it, what he did with it. Now, there's another little sidelight to this I thought about is it that the argument could quickly be made back to me. All right, let's go back to your little, your, your gorgeous rose, that large, blooming rose that was cream and with the blush tips on it was so pretty. Actually, God didn't make that man did. Uh, that rose did not arise spontaneously from nature. Some horticulturalist was, who was competing in contests somewhere kept putting rose varieties together in different combinations until he finally came up with this particular combination that finally produced this rose and I thought yeah okay fine but you know we think we are creating when we're doing that we're really not we're just dressing and keeping and manipulating the plants and putting different gene combinations and we really can't say that this man created this rose any more than you might say if you pop a kaleidoscope up your eye and you rotate it a half a turn that you have created a new pattern out of what you did because the truth is, it is an accidental combination of, of, of the bits and pieces in that kaleidoscope as you turn it that create all those new patterns as you, as you keep on turning it and keep on turning it and keep on turning it. And of course, all the horticulturist does is with some intelligence keep rotating the pieces, but he does not know what he is going to get. He can guess, he has a range, he has some knowledge, but they work and they work and they work and they change and they put different combinations together and they come up with these things. But... They are not really creating these things. They are actually putting together something else. The admiration uh, of the rose is one thing. 
as I said. But the admiration of the rose as an act of God is something else. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You know, one of the things that's interesting to me about what I just said to you is that not only do we have a God who creates beauty, staggering beauty, who grants us pleasure in that beauty, who creates things like the apple, and of course man has manipulated the genes and created different varieties of apples, as far as that's concerned, and peaches and so forth. And God who gives us the sunset and gives us the pleasure that we take in sunset. The God who, as I sit out here on my deck on a summer's evening, and I can hear the rumble of thunder, and I, I can't tell you the pleasure that I take from the scent in the air, the rumble of thunder coming from not too far away, and the realization of, of, of the oncoming rain is, is a moment of absolutely exquisite pleasure. Who made that possible? God made that possible. And every one of these pleasures is a, a little shaft of light that comes out of the glory of God. And they're in, 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 their, in their individual, they're like the flicker of light off of a diamond. But the source of the light is the sun. And the comparison between the small pleasures that we take in this life and the nature of God is like looking at a flicker of light, not the diamond, but the flicker of light off the diamond, compared to the source of the light, which is the sun. Now, I, I, the thing that is really also in this that, 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 that strikes me is that, that God has given to man the privilege of working to create new things out of his creation. That the, the man who made that rose, or created the variety of rose, who finally put the, all the genetic codes together to make that rose work, was working in partnership with God, who has granted to man the privilege of doing that kind of thing, of creating beauty, of expanding beauty, of making ugly things beauty, of taking things that are dirty and making them clean, of the things that, that we as human beings have the privilege of doing, is, is uh, you know, I don't know if you realize what I'm saying to you here, but what is going on in this room at this particular moment is worship. It is an adoration of God, a praise of God, an acknowledgement of God, of who he is, and a, a profoundly uh, joyous appreciation of the pleasures that he grants to us as, as human beings. Now, C.S. Lewis said something else I thought that was very important. And this one, I, this one really struck me when I read through it. He said, The simplest act of obedience is an act of worship that transcends most of the stuff that we think of as worship. I'll read it again for you. The simplest act of worship is, I'm sorry, the simplest act of obedience is greater than what we normally think of as acts of worship. Now, what he means by this is the simple little things that we do. Take, for example, you know, Friday comes along, and you know the Sabbath's coming on, and you start Friday morning, you, you, you have sunset Friday night on your mind. And you get all your preparation done, you get your house clean, you get your groceries bought, you get some of your cooking done, so that... And you plan ahead so that when the sun slips over the horizon, you're able to sit back in the chair, put your feet up, have a drink, have something to eat, uh, go to the table, light candles, for example, with the family for, for a candlelight dinner, and be able to sit down together and stop your work, stop your activities, and honor God in what you're doing. That simple little thing is an act of adoration of God. It is an act of worship, as he put it, that transcends most of the stuff that we think of oftentimes as worship. I think when a person actually takes steps to, to reach out to and to help the poor in the name of Jesus. You know, he said that whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these, these little ones in my name shall not lose his reward. That the giving of a cup of cold water in obedience to Jesus Christ is an act of adoration to me. Whenever we in the autumn pack up the car with all of our kids and get the car ready, change the oil, get the tire, check the tire pressures, and, and do all the things we do, and we trundle off to somewhere to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, we're going there to see our friends. We're going there to have a good time. We're going there to eat, drink, and be merry. But we're not going, we wouldn't be going there if it were not for the commandment of God that says that in the autumn of the year, in the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall keep the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days of the Lord, would we? Would we have what we have? Would we have the pleasure of, of, of company? Would we have the pleasure of the food? Would we be able to receive the inspiration of, 
of the sermons that we get? Uh, would we be able to get together and sing to the high heavens and rattle the windows of the building with praises to God if it were not for that simple act of obedience that we have decided we would keep the Feast of Tabernacles? That the simplest act of obedience is an act of adoration of God. It's a marvelous thing to consider and, and, to, and to look forward to the things that we do. And there are so many things that, that, that we, I think, never think of as worship or adoration. They are not worship in the Old Testament sense or the New Testament sense. They are worship in the sense we use the word in the modern world of adoration of God, is that when we take time to find out about people who are, who are a little sick or who are hurting or who are downtrodden and who may have difficulties in their lives, and we call them up on the phone, if we do this kind of thing because of the things Jesus told us to do, we are committing, as it were, an act of adoration toward God. You know, in, the, in, in many years ago, I mean, years, ages gone past, a lot of people read the Bible, I think, more than now. And a lot of people who read the Bible were profoundly moved by many of the things that they read there. I don't think that a lot of them understood God. I don't think they understood a lot about God's plan. Uh, I don't think they, they, they grasped some things about God, but there was an age, I think, though, when people took the Bible more literally. They took it more, and by literally, I don't mean necessarily things like the age of the earth is 6,000 years. I mean that when Jesus said, pure, I mean, when we, they read in their Bible, pure religion and undefiled, you know, before God is to visit the fatherless and the widows and their afflictions and to keep yourself unspotted from the world, I believe they took that literally. And they said, you're supposed to visit the father, the widows and the fatherless and their afflictions, and you are supposed to keep yourself unspotted from the world. I believe that when they read some of the Psalms, and they read the prophets, that they read these things and they took them seriously. A lot of these people who had certain talents were so moved by what they read that they wrote music of absolutely unparalleled beauty. And I, I, I had thought I would bring a hymnal uh, to, to in here, and I forgot to bring it in. But to make reference to it, uh, there are so many hymnals. Take, for example, the one in our hymnal called Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, God of Glory, God of Praise. If you read your way through that hymn, that's an astonishing piece of worship and adoration of God. I, I have, it's, it's been a point of, of some dismay for me, frankly, for a long time, that, that when we come together in the church, oftentimes we, the song service is something we kind of get out of the way. We would sing our songs, we hope they wouldn't have more than two, uh, let's give them, you know, so we can sit back down again. And uh, let's get the song service out of the way so we can get on to the sermon and the message. And I don't know, maybe let's get on the sermon and get, over, get the closing in and get home. I don't know. But, but it was something to get out of the way. And yet, of all the things that we do, in our, in our churches, in our tradition, of all the things that we do, the one moment of true praise of God, the one moment of real adoration of God, is the song service. You know, oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love, our shield, our defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. I mean, you know, you look at that stuff and you think, you know, is this something that you should toss off? Is this something we let slide away from us? I mean, here you've got this gorgeous music written by really talented people that has survived down through all these ages, and somebody back there, some person back there was so moved by something you saw that he had to put it down and he had to set it to music. And it's very difficult for me to comprehend how anybody could have written the kind of music that goes with some of these songs or written the words that are in them if they had not had a, a, an awareness of the glory of God, of the power of God, of the majesty of God, of the strength of God. There's another line in that song, how that dark is his path on the wings of the storm, you know, that the awareness of God and who he is and what he does. Uh, uh, these people really got that. I, I, one of the things that, that I, I, I'm sad about is I feel a lot of times that, that a lot of us have tended to shy away from the adoration of God, I think, because we have misinterpreted it as a kind of sentimentalism or an emotionalism and have kind of, I don't know, in our, in our tradition, we have had a very matter-of-fact approach to religion. And it's been very, uh, you know, square corners and, and right down the line and, and all the, di the T's dotted and all the I's crossed and, and so forth. And we kind of always tended to look a little suspiciously at, at, at people who would become a bit emotional or a bit sentimental about God. And people will look at some hymns, for example, and they will say, well, that's kind of Protestant. 
I don't know what that means to say that it's, quote, Protestant, except that they are sung in a lot of Protestant churches. But the, 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 the implication in it is that we are the people and wisdom will die with us. You know, we, we, we're the ones, we have the truth of God, and nobody else has got the truth of God, and nobody else can understand about God, and these people aren't Sabbath keepers, so therefore they, they can't be observing God. And what's strange about that when you think about it, I think some of those people kept Sabbath better than we do. They kept it on the wrong day, but they kept it better than we do. Uh, I, I, I've said to some people, uh, and I'll mention it here, that they, when it comes a surprise to you that Teddy Roosevelt's father, his family, were very, very strict Sabbath people. They didn't work on the Sabbath. The meal was prepared the day before. She didn't cook on the Sabbath. They didn't, they didn't go out horseback riding on the Sabbath. They were very strict Sabbath people. Kept it on Sunday, but they kept the Sabbath day in their mind, in their heart. I don't know how God looks at that. I'm not about to start judging people in that regard, but, but, but it's, it's, it's very, it's arrogant of us, frankly, to look down our nose at other people and say, well, that person can't possibly have had a real experience with God. They can't really have, have known anything about God because they didn't keep the Sabbath the way we keep the Sabbath. When in God's eyes, it, he may look upon them and say, hey, they kept a Sabbath. I'm not sure what that is you're doing. But you call Sabbath people. Uh, give some thought to that, you might, along the way. I, I think it's an important thing to consider. I, I really feel that, 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 that not in a, in a public way, not in an effort to work up emotion, not in an effort to work up feeling, but that on your own and alone and your prayers and your talking to God, you ought to examine yourself sometime about, this, about what, how much resistance there is in you to, to feeling something relative to God. For is God the God of our minds only? Is he the God of our mind and our body? Or is he also the God of our emotions and our feelings? How can one contemplate the nature of God and not be moved. It's one thing, uh, frankly, to consider God and to say that God is, you know, but by logic and by reason and by scripture, I can prove to you that God is adorable. That is, he is to be adored. It is another thing entirely to experience or to know or to come to God as one who is, is adored, not as one who is to be adored. And it's something that, I think it's something that a lot of us ought to give a little more thought to than perhaps we had before. Now, I want to, I want to take you in the Bible to a, a, a truly great example of, of adoration of God. It's back in Second Chronicles, the fifth chapter. Now, the story is not unfamiliar to us all. It's, you know, David wanted to build a temple. God would not allow him, but he did allow Solomon to build the temple. Uh, got myself in the wrong place. Second Chronicles, the fifth chapter. And so went on the work year after year, year after year, in the process of building this great, magnificent edifice, which came to be known as Solomon's Temple. In chapter 5, it says of this Second Chronicles 5, Thus all the work that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and all the instruments he put among the treasuries of the house. Then Solomon assembled the elders and all the, the, the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. So they all assembled themselves. They put the staves in the Ark. They carried this Ark up to the temple of God. They placed it in its place, <clears throat> drew out the staves that were in there, and, and, and everything was done to get everything done as it was. In verse 11 it says, It came to pass that when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were there were, were present, sancti I'm sorry, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, and did not one of them wait by course. So the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, Jeduthun, with their sons, their brethren, arrayed in white linen, and I can assure you on this day they were very careful about the cleanness and the whiteness of all the linen, because even the even the matter of saying, I'm coming to do work for God, and I must, I must dress as God told me to do, you know, is, is something one does to God. It is not merely something, you know, the Pharisees, I, I believe, had come to the place to where the act and the obedience to God was, was an end in itself. That in the doing of this act, I have done something to put myself in, in, in a good relationship with God, and you haven't done it, therefore you're not in a good relationship with God. It was a, it was a very down in the dirt, approach to doing the, you know, all these things. They were very, uh, is all totally earthy. 
But if one can if one can go through these things with an awareness not of how I look to my fellow man, but of the fact that I am honoring God by what I'm doing, you've got a different kettle of fish entirely. And so being arrayed in their white linen, having symbols and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar with them a hundred and twenty priests blowing on trumpets. Now, the biggest thing of adoration to God that was there on this moment was that building, that huge monument that these men had given their, you know, the, the amount of time and work, hours of labor that had gone into putting that building up there and materials and, and, and the cost and human sacrifice and bruised thumbs and perhaps lost lives, who knows, in the course of the process of it, was enormous. And it was all built to the glory of God. Now these men have all gathered around there, all the trumpets and all the accoutrements and the ark is in its place, and he then says, it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in the praising and thanking of the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of God. God moved in. And it figures, doesn't it, that, that where there is adoration, there is love. And where there is love, we want to be. And so that these people who had in this enormous outpouring of work and love and honor and adoration of God had built the building, and in great love of God had come together and blew trumpets in praise of God and sang songs in praise of God and banged cymbals in praise of God and all the things that were the custom of their time, which would have been celebration. And, and all, in, in all of this joy and excitement, and there was great pleasure in what they were doing. Now I came back to the word pleasure again. You know there is pleasure in building. You know there is pleasure in, in, in productive work. You know there is pleasure in creating beauty. You know there is satisfaction in seeing a job finally come together and close out and be finished. Ghastly it's encouraging and exciting to do that. We built this house, you know, not with our hands. We we got people to build it, but went through the whole process and the selection and the, the, the you know picking out the bricks and and arguing with the contractor and the subcontractors and, and all the things you do, the satisfaction of it finished is indescribable. And I wasn't even building this house to God. To have built one to God the way they built this one, with the very best that they could possibly do in every circumstance, is the satisfaction and the sheer pleasure and joy of the completion of it is really kind of hard to imagine. And then the pleasure of the day, the pleasure of the, of the sound and the music and of all that was being done. This pleasure is a gift of God. The joy in it of all that we do in trying to do things for God, the pleasure that comes back out of them is one of the great gifts that he gives back to us that says that he is, that he is there, and that it is this God that we serve and not some other God. It is it is God that cares about us enough to give us an apple rather than giving us a, you know, some old gray, pulpy, miserable, sludgy piece of fruit. It is this God who wants us to take pleasure in, in our life and the things that we do and the work that we do. And the, this is the God that we, we worship, worship, adore, serve, are grateful to. Uh, this is, this is a great thing that took place here. Then said Solomon, the Lord, has said that he would he would dwell in the thick darkness. The priest couldn't even get into this place because it was so dark and, and the cloud was so strong in the place. Solomon said, The Lord has said he would dwell in the thick darkness, but I have built a house of habitation for you and a place for your dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel, and every one of them stood up like one man. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has with his hand fulfilled that which he spoke with his mouth to my father David, saying, since the day I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, that my name might be there. I didn't choose any man to be a ruler over my people. I chose Jerusalem that my name might be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And he talked about the history of the temple and all the things that were to be done. And he prayed a great, a great, a great prayer to God in adoration. He said, Actually, verse 13, So when Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long, five cubits broad, and he set it up in the midst of the court, and he got up on it, he stood there, and then he kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread out his hands before him. This is the king doing an act of obeisance. It isn't always to bow your head down. In this case, he put his knees down. He bowed on his knees, and this is the king. This is the man to whom everyone else bowed. Goes to his knees raises up his hands for heaven and says, O God, Lord of Israel, 
There is no God like you in the heaven or in the earth that keep covenant and show mercy unto your servants that walk before you with all their hearts. There is no God like you. You know, that is a, that's, I feel utterly inadequate, utterly inadequate to express what that ought to, that ought to draw out of the depths of a being of a person in the sense of the awareness of God. And we wander through our life like a bunch of grubs on the ground or ants in an ant farm, utterly unaware of, of, of the greatness that surrounds us. Even though it intrudes into our life at every corner, at every angle, at every, at every approach of life. And we run smack dab into it day in and day out, day in and day out. Even the love that we get from the people that we're close with is a gift of God. Uh, the color of the sky is a gift of God. The, the breath of air on your cheek is a, is a gift of God. The color of the leaves on the trees in the autumn is a gift of God. And we just keep coming into contact with it all the time. And we wind up, as I say, like the ant, the ant farm wandering down this, down this hole and up this hole over here, utterly unaware, some, it seems to me, of these things until we force ourselves to stop and appreciate the shaft of sunlight that falls on the floor, the, the cold spring water that we might catch in a cup out of a spring and drink, the taste of an apple as we bite into it and to contemplate the greatness of the mind that made us, made the apple, and gave us the capacity to appreciate the pleasure that he gave us in having done it. There is no God like you in the heaven of the earth that keeps covenant and shows mercy unto your servants that walk before you with all their hearts. You which have kept with your servant David my father, and he goes on with all this. He says then later, but will God dwell with men on the earth? Oh, the heaven, the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you. Why should I expect this house, which my hands have built, to contain you? He was just overwhelmed by the greatness of God. It's a, it's a marvelous prayer. It's a tremendously encouraging prayer that, that goes through here. And, and it's a good example and a good model of a man who had talked to God, a man who had, came, had come to understand the significance of God, and there's a caution in it because in his later life, he returned to the ant farm, you know, back to the hole in the ground, wandering around forgetting God. He became much too pleased with himself and proud of himself. And I think in, in, in his life began to lose contact with God through through the things that he did. God appeared in chapter 7, verse 12, to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send a pestilence among my people, bad things, folks, are going to happen. All right? Bad things are going to happen. Okay, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. My. When the adoration goes to God, the reply comes back to God, you know, things are going to happen that you're not going to like. There are going to be things that come into your life. You're going to, somebody you love dearly is going to die unexpectedly in, a, in an untimely manner. Somebody you're very close to is going to agonize for lunch on a deathbed and die, and you're going to sit there crying out saying, why is this happening? There's going to be a time when you're going to be lying in bed and saying, why me, Lord? And he says it is going to happen. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And I've always thought about little children who, who will climb up into mama's face and mama's trying to talk to somebody else and not paying a bit of attention to them. They finally put their hand on their face and pull it around and they want mama's face. He said, if you will seek my face. And Solomon's prayer is a good example of one who comes to God in adoration and to whom God turns his face. And he says, if you will do this and turn from your wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive your sin, I'll heal your land. This is a promise made to a whole passel of people out there. But I think the promise actually comes back in many ways to us so that we also can understand it, believe it, so that it can also affect our lives. To worship God, to do obey, obey obeisance, calls God into our life. To adore God, to speak of His greatness, to accept the pleasures that come into our life as, as little bitty hints of the joy that is in the presence of God and of the pleasures that are in His right hand forevermore. If, you know, we can, if we can understand these things, we can come to know God. And to know God is to love Him. And we might come to the place where the psalmist came. You will show me the path of life. In your presence 
is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Would you all like to rise and we'll close this session in prayer? <coughs> Almighty God and Father in heaven, we come to you, Father, to say that we adore you. And it is not merely a, a word that we toss out there. We recognize you. We know who you are. And we thank you, Father, for the joy. We thank you for the pleasures that you shatter into a shower into our lives and for the way in which you touch our lives with day in and day out. For the love of children, for the love of wives and husbands, for the love of, of mother and father, of all the things that come our way in this life, Father, that we would not have if it were not for you. We not only thank you, we pause to consider what kind of a God you are that give us these things. Keep us safe, Father, as all of us you know, go our ways, and, and Father, help us to stay close to you and to recognize you as we, as we have fellowship together. We put our lives and our trust in your hands in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.